get to the point of scheduling an inspection, which I found, thank goodness I don't have to do it, my wife does it. As I mentioned earlier, use a mapping program and I'm sure you guys probably have something if you're not using Xactimates or some, other, some mapping program, but map all your claims. My wife will map the claims. She'll figure out if I'm doing six a day, she'll pick out six in an area where I can be the most efficient. She will contact those people. She will call them and she will set the appointment. When do we set the appointment? If we get a hundred claims in, we're going to map all hundred claims and we're going to set appointments until we run out of people or until we need to hold somebody off to fill out a day. Because once you get them mapped and called and scheduled, they will quit calling you saying, when you coming? So your phone stops ringing. Even if you're in Jersey, we did this 10, 15 days out. As long as you had them scheduled, they knew when you were coming, they quit calling. Now, mapping program that she uses, as I mentioned, is an older program, but she actually figures out the driving distance between claims, how long it takes to get the claims. She figures out how long it's going to take me for claims. And she doesn't give me time, much less than have a glass of water, much less. She works our tail end. We're not like, we're not like the cable company. We don't say we'll be there sometime between nine and five. I value people's time. And we tell them that if I'm going to be there at 1030, I'm going to be there at 1030. And I tell them if I'm going to be over 30 minutes early or 30 minutes late, you will get a call from either me or my wife. I'll let them know. That's another thing that if you do, if you're running out, late and you show up two hours late, they're not in a good mood. And that's not a good way to start a claim because there again, it goes back from the first contact and now we're getting to the point where we're setting the inspection and gonna do the inspection. We wanna ease that tension level to get them down to the point where they are confident that you're gonna do a good job and take care of them. She also calls them back the day before the claim. And let them know you're scheduled for just want to remind you you're scheduled for the inspection tomorrow certain time people appreciate that and like i said in new jersey she had talked to him once on the phone when we got the claim she called him when we scheduled the claim and then she called him again to remind him of the claim and by the guy by the time i got there the first words out of your wife out of your, their mouth was boy your wife is the nicest person i've ever talked to she did more to level to get the tension level down than i ever Good. And that helps get the claim off to a good start. I like to start from the hotel to the farthest I'm going away and work my way back. Because usually traffic is easy, better in the morning than it is in the afternoon. And we start, I get up at 4.30, I finish my preliminary reports. I take a shower, get cleaned up. I'm in waiting for them to set breakfast out at six o'clock if they're serving at six o'clock. As soon as we get done eating, we're loaded up and we're gone. I find that I have more time to drive going out in the morning than coming back. So, and plus, as we'll get into here in a minute, the evenings after the day of inspection is probably the most trying time of the day, to be honest with you. One thing you have to remember about scheduling and working is it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. If you're working by yourself or if you've got one helper and you're just now starting to get into flood and you're still feeling your way through it even after you go through Justin's product training I would recommend him scheduling three no more than four inspections the first day because it's going to take you a lot longer because one you're going to be thorough and it's just going to take you a while to get your system down to where you can do it fast and down. So I was talking earlier, there's guys that go out there and they brag about, I did eight, well, I did 10 inspections. They're not doing inspections. They're just going out and taking photos and doing a very poor job. And they're gonna write a poor estimate. They're gonna have a layer in have a camper. I'll share this with you. Each day when I get ready to go out and do my inspections, Cheryl will hand me, here are your claims for today. They're in files, they're in folders, they're stacked up. There's a master list of the addresses on top. There's a map printed off of my complete route in case 
there's road closures and I can look on a piece of paper and know which way to go. And that is worth a ton having that done. I think it's probably the most important thing there is. And I think the first 20 to 30 minutes of the inspection is the most important time you want to spend with these people. Be professional, but be polite. First thing I do is I show my flood certification card. I carry it around my neck. I show it to them. I pull out my driver's license and I show them a photo of me. Why? Because by that time, they're already getting stories of people having fake IDs and robbing people and you'll hear some more stories. That's another thing once they find out who I am, that I'm actually, it makes them feel a little bit better. They're going, everybody's going to have a story. And they want to show you. They want to whip out that phone and start showing you photos of how they stood in the balcony and watched water come in their house. One guy told me, you know, about in Houston about how the National Guard helicopter dropped the basket down and they got in it, and pulled them out. Another guy told me in West Virginia how he knocked a hole in the ceiling and stood on the refrigerator to get out of the water. So you hear some, but they, it don't matter what it is, they want to tell you their story. It's about them. Now FEMA in one of their presentations talked about something that I, I found was interesting. They said that a doctor that spends three minutes more with a patient has 50% less lawsuits. Even if they're doing the same thing and the same quality of doctor. That extra three minutes, people want to be heard. People want to have your undivided attention. They want to be able to ask you questions. So when I go into a, the inspection, on average, I'm going to spend between 20 and 40 minutes with that insured before I take a photo, before I do anything. The first several minutes, I'm going to listen to them. And then I'm going to go into what we call our spiel that we do in each claim. Now, while I'm doing that, I mentioned about a team approach. Now, I want to talk about it this time. When I, we go up and introduce ourselves, after we introduce ourselves, Chad and Aaron would go outside and they'd start getting their outside measurements, outside photos, getting all the things that they need outside. Then, they would come inside. Chad's job was he drew the interior sketch. Aaron's job was he got the camera and he went and took a photo and wrote down the serial number of every appliance, water heater, furnace, everything on an appliance sheet that we had. I never want to look at a photo to get a serial number. I want it on a piece of paper. If I'm writing an estimate or if I have my estimate writer on the paper. He appreciates that. So in this case, that's what I had the young man doing. Now, while they were doing the sketch and doing this, I was spending my time with the insured, which I'll get back to. After I got done with my 30 or 40 minutes with the insured, I went outside, I did the scope notes on the exterior. Then I would come inside and we would go into the room and usually with Aaron, or Chad, if he was done on Big House, he may not be done sketching it. And then we would start doing our scope notes inside and taking our photos, which I'll get into a little bit more in a minute. All right, so what do I tell the insured when I'm big with them? I tell them a, big, a brief background, kind of like what I mentioned a while ago about my construction background, insurance background, how long I've been doing flood claims. I can tell them all I do is flood insurance claims. And I tell them, and this is honest truth. I have not had a person do 219 claims in Sandy and did not have one person call me and say they didn't get enough money to fix your house. I did not have anybody in Houston call me and say they did not get enough money to fix the house. I let them know that we're Christians and the reason that we do this is because we like to help people. I let them know I'm not wealthy, but I'm not poor. I could be home playing golf, but we enjoy helping people. And I let them know FEMA doesn't like me saying this. 
I'll let them know. We get paid a percentage of the claim. I have no reason not to get you, not to cheat you. In fact, I guarantee you, I will not lie and I will not cheat, but I'll get you every dollar you're entitled to. And that right there, everybody will say, that's all I want. And then you can just build the tension level and continue to come down. Also share with them what I'm there for today. Here's what I'm gonna do while I'm here today. The guys are getting measurements and photos outside. We're diagramming the house. I'm going to, when I get done meeting with you, I'm gonna make a list of everything that needs to be repaired. And before I leave here today, I will go over those with you. And then we'll talk about the timeline of when we're gonna get the estimate to you. We will also, I bring up the fact the, the estimating program that we use, I let them know I will use an estimating program. The one we choose to use most of the time is Xactimate. I have other choices, but Xactimate will create more dollars for you. And it will come near making sure we have enough money to get your house fixed. Because that's our goal is to make sure you don't get the short end of the stick. Set so in that estimate, it's going to be room by room, item by item. It's going to be redundant to some degree. But it's going to be based, pricing is going to be based on your zip code. And we're going to include 10% overhead for the contractor, 10% for profit. And we're going to include, include cleanup and dry out and to treat for mold. They like that word, treat for mold, because that's one of their fears, as it should be. So the, price, the level continues to come down. Then I get into, we have a form that we have to go through called the hello letter that talks about the nine things you have to do to get the claim paid. And that's gonna be on the website eventually. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it, but I go through with it. I'll let them know that you have 60 days to get a, what's called a proof of loss completed. You're gonna get a form in the mail and you're gonna look at that form and you're gonna say, the letter's gonna say, you have filed a flood claim and you have 60 days to file a proof of loss. If you don't file a proof of loss in 60 days, your claim can be denied. It scares the heck out of them thinking they're gonna figure out a way to cheat me on my claim. So I tell them, you're gonna get that letter. When you get that letter, just fold it up and throw it on the counter and just tell yourself, Kenny's gonna take care of that for me because I will. I'll come to my computer program will complete it. I will send it to you ready for your signature. All you're gonna to have to do is sign one time and date it. And we'll get your claim settled. Also complete what we call the flood survey, field, flood field survey. And I tell them that that is basically information I need to fill out my report, which it is. It will go through it very systematic and it will ask them what time the water got in the house, how long water stayed in the house. It will ask them there, uh, once again about the mortgagee. It will ask them whose name is the, the deed in. Now, this is one reason why I verify them when I call them the first time about the name on the policy of the name and insured. I had a claim one time, it was Louisiana. And I'm doing a claim, I'm getting it done. I said, okay, this, 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 and this. I said, I want to verify it. I got the policy name in the name of Joe and Jill, whatever it was. I am telling you that little woman come off the ground about that high. That's his ex-wife and what's her name doing on the policy? <laughs> I should have asked the question in the first contact interview before I got to their inspection. I could have nipped in the butt, so. Verify the name on the policy and do you own the property? Had another situation Ex-wife was on the policy. You gotta get the divorce papers. You gotta get the degree that they ain't gonna take nobody's word for it. Same with mortgagee. If the mortgagee's incorrect, you have to get the documentation showing that the mortgagee's been claimed, been changed. If the mortgagee's been released, been paid off, you gotta get the release letter. It's better to address that in the first contact so that they can have that there for you to give it to you when you do the inspection. One thing I'm not going to talk much about, 
a large number of claims that we do each year. It's their second, third, fourth, fifth time they've been flooded. That's why the flood program's losing so much money, to be honest with you. About 40% of what they pay out is on repetitive claims. And they can't cancel them. They can't surcharge them because Congress won't let them. I talked to them more toward the end about contents. I like to save that toward the end, a little bit toward my spill and cover that in detail. I ask them, I let them know that contents has to be done room by room, item by item. Now we can bunch items together like 16 pairs of women's tennis shoes, put an average price, average cost. And I tell them, put the replacement cost. What would it go cost to buy them today at normal prices, not on the Labor Day special, but at normal prices. And I will add sales tax into it because I have to depreciate those items. And I'll do it and I don't let the computer do it because I'm more gentle than the computer. We talk about that and I ask them, <coughs> do you do Excel spreadsheet? And it's amazing how many people do. So I'll make a note on the folders, send down that, send Excel spreadsheet. Let them do the work for me instead of me having to do it or having a hard time. But I bet you close to half the people in Houston had Excel spreadsheet. I also talked to them about this. Well, they said, when will you get my claim done? So that's, that's a good question. Here's how it works. If you've got contents coverage, I don't write the billing estimate until we get your contents list. So those who get on the ball and get me their list first is going to get their estimate first. Now, obviously, if they don't have contents coverage, we try to get it out pretty quick. But I want something to nudge them along to get off their tail end and give me that contents list. I don't want one a year and two months later like I got the other day. So I, refuse, I, I will put them last. I just like tell them. If you're not going to, I guess I got to send it in all one time. It's a little white lie, just a little bit. Don't have to, but I don't like doing supplements. They don't want us to do supplements. Of course, we always offer an advance payment if there is no underwriting issues. If there is an underwriting issue, there's a form called a non-waiver, which gives, gets signed so the insurance company can send the reservation of rights letter. Anytime there's an underwriting issue, anytime there's a mortgagee issue, anytime there's any issue, basically on the loss notice, you have to fill that out and send it in. And if you're doing a non-waiver for any particular item, I don't do an advance payment. If they do not want the advance payment, I have them write on there, not want it and have them sign it. But we have to send it in. We have to offer it and we have to prove that we offered it. So either do an advance payment or have them write on there, not want it. If they do want an advance payment, let's talk about that. In Harvey, you know, we had large claims. You know, I've, I've given a $100,000 advance before. I didn't have a mortgagee. But in Harvey, a lot of adjusters were going around giving a $50,000 advance, get them started. And there's not, I don't have an issue with that. But here's the problem with doing that. Anytime you do an advance payment, you send the check to the insured, it's got the mortgagee's name on it. So the mortgagee gets it, they won't release it. Anything over $10,000, they won't release until you start getting receipts. So I would always do the first advance at $10,000. So they would get it released. The mortgagee will release the $10,000 so they can get some money, pay SARP Pro, or whoever they're gonna to do to get cleaned up. Then I said, then when you start doing some work, call me. We'll, we'll submit a second and third one which we did, I submitted minutes three and four. Now, a lot of gestures said, I ain't gonna do that. I ain't gonna do that work. I wanna do $50,000 and get it out of my hair because I don't wanna mess with it. Well, is that really doing what's best for the insured? I don't think so. So I went the extra mile in explaining that. And I even had some tell me that, I'm glad you only give me 10,000. My neighbor got 50 and he couldn't cash his. He couldn't get any money. From they, they released mine. Now let's talk about the inspection. First number, first photo you're going to take is 
claim number. Why? Because when you average claim is between 150 and about between 100 and 150 photos per claim. The difference with one of the things between flood and property, these are long claims. They may, you may have 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 claims open because we don't start doing estimates until after all the inspections are done. And they require a lot of photos, which I will address some of them. Take a photo of the address of the risk. The reason we do the claim number is when you put them in your system, depending on how you load them, you can find the claim number, you can stop and see where the claim, those photos stop and start, and where you can move those particular photos into the file. Outside photos, Justin wants you to take eight. I put four on mine. Front right corner, I start. I always start at the right, front right corner and work my way around. Go. Take as many photos as necessary to get all angles of the house. Now, one of the most important photos, you have to take a photo of an exterior water line. Now, on a big flood, it's usually pretty easy to see. You can see it on the garage door or you can see it somewhere. But when you got basement claims, you got to maybe up to the concrete blocks or whatever, and it's got water in the basement, you take a, you take an exterior with tape. You can find a dark spot, a piece of mold, or by golly, you can find something to find a one or two inch water mark. But you better find one, because if you don't find one, they'll kick it back. <clears throat> so you can always find one if you look hard enough. That's why I carry a small 12 foot tape with me. Everything's done on tape. They want, it, they want you to put the tape to the ground, take a photo, show the water line, tape, show you exactly how deep you get. Your photos tell the story. Take a photo of the source of flooding. If you're next to a creek or a river or the ocean, take a picture of it. If you're in a place where you're in a valley and you got four hills all around you, take a picture of the four hills and show where the water came from. Because we have, to, that's one of the things that underwriters really, really look at. Let's talk about the AC unit. Big issue, big issue. I've seen AC units. When my house got, my shop got flooded, my heat pump got completely covered over with water. That's still running today. I flipped the electric off so it didn't burn the panel out of it. it let it dry out and still running. But when you get a flood event, if it's brackish water and it gets up on the air conditioning, replace it. So it's just gonna heat it up and rust it out. If it's clear water, flood, it needs to get up to the bottom of the controls. And they usually set about that high off the ground on most of them. But you may be there and remember this, anytime you see an exterior water mark and you can see debris in the grates of an AC unit, the water always gets deeper than the water line because the water line doesn't get created until it settles down and starts going down. So when, there's, when it's at its height and there's some wave action, it's getting water on. So what does FEMA say on AC units? They say if it, if it didn't get up on the controls, you're not certain and it still works, get it serviced. And if it quits six months down the road, we'll do a supplement on it. However, ah, it's up to the insured to prove that it quit working because of the flood and not some of so what I do, I have a, I have the insured get AC guy out there to look at it. And I tell him, I want his opinion on what, the, what he thinks it needs. If, it need, if his recommendation is it's running right now, but he's not sure how long it's gonna work, and he thinks it needs to be replaced, I want an estimate, and I want these words on it. Damaged by flood replacement required. That covers my tell him. I said, then we'll send it in. You'll get paid for the AC unit. If it works three months, fine. You put the money in your savings account. When you need to replace it, you've got it. Then you don't have to go back and fight for it. 
but I need something to protect me. Now, another thing on AC unit, we have to take a photo. I take a photo of the unit. I walk up and take a picture of the Bream or Hartman, Hartman, whatever on top, Goodman. Then I turn over and I take a picture of the tag. We have to get serial numbers. Now, some other serial numbers are worn off on some of the older units. The tag may be where you can't read it. Take a picture where the tag was or take a picture of the tag that you cannot read. If you can read the tag, something I wanna share with you, and you may already know this. There's nothing worse than putting down for replacement of a three ton AC unit, and it's a four ton unit or a four ton, it's a five ton. Because the AC guy's gonna catch it, he's gonna tell, the insured and it's going to make you look bad. So how do you tell how many tonnage an AC unit is? On the sixth or seventh level, le sixth or seventh eighth letter on the model number, it's going to be 36, 42, 48, 60, whatever that number is divided by 12. And that's how many tons that unit is. It says 60, it's a five ton unit. It says 48, it's a four ton unit. So that makes you, and of course it affects the pricing when you're pricing them out. And it makes you look more professional because you're not doing something that is gonna get caught and it does get caught quite often. And it makes you look bad. After you get done getting your outside photos and getting the information on the AC unit. Walk around the unit, the building again, because the foundation is covered. The foundation is covered and if you see cracks in it or see cracks in a brick, take photos of it because you're going, they're going to see, there's going to be some shifting. If they've got the carpet off the floor and it's got a concrete slab floor, you also want to get photos of that. The reason for that is, does it warrant getting a hiring a structural engineer? So those are your photos that you send with a request for structural engineer. Now the insurance company will pay for the structural engineer. Pay him well, about $2,200. And he will come out and he will do his thing and he will tell you if it's covered, if it's caused by hydrostatic pressure or whether it's caused by settlement. Settlement is not covered, hydrostatic pressure is. Most of the time on a concrete slab, they're not going to cover it, but it's not our job to make that determination. We don't have the degree. And so if it's marginal, then FEMA wants you to use professionals. They want you to request a structural engineer. And they write a really good report. Now, I usually don't wait on their report because sometimes <clears throat> it may take five or six weeks, depending on how busy they are. That might be one of the few reasons I write a supplement and most, most of the time, Though I can, I can tell if it's hydrostatic pressure. If it's a basement and the basement walls are pushed in on the side and it's got concrete blocks and they're making a shape like this and you stick your finger in it, that's probably going to be hydrostatic pressure. If it's stair step cracked, it's probably <clears throat> settlement. Crawl space, we talked about that briefly a while ago. I do not crawl under crawl spaces. I just stick, oh, turn my flash on, stick my head in there and kind of take about five photos around because what I'm looking for is wiring. If water got up into the unit, we're probably gonna rewire the whole, the whole thing anyway. So I'm not worried about any feeder lines coming in, but I wanna see duct work. I wanna see if it's got floor insulation and I wanna see what type of subfloor because there is nothing worse than you replacing the subfloor with I've seen it, half inch plywood, and you look at it, and it's one by six plank or one by 12 plank or OSB or one of the other. And while I'm thinking about that, if you got a situation where you got a subfloor replacement, and I will tell you nine out of 10 people will not replace the subfloor, but they get paid for it. <clears throat> they hardly ever replace it. If you've got a crawl space with duct work in the, floor, in the crawl space, when you go into the house, make sure you pull a diffuser, pull the metal over, take a photo and see if it's got underlayment. Because more than likely, depending on when the house was built, 
It's going to have half inch plywood and half inch underlayment or three quarter plywood and three quarter overlayment, underlayment. And take a photo of it and document it because we can pay for both of them. But don't send it in without a photo because they'll question you. That generates a lot of dollars for the insured. All right, I'm going to move on to the interior inspection. I used the Sketchit clipboard. This will be in, in your packet for the exterior. The, write the diagram on it. I print usually five pages like this. All it has is the client's information name at the top, and it's just a blank piece of paper. Put this over so you can see it better. I do my sketch on that, and I do my scope notes on them. Why? Because if I get a situation where just a win or something happens and I get my files mixed up, I go back and find it because it's got the claim number on it, it's got the insurance name on it, it's got all the information on it. And I think it looks more professional. So we use this, but then Sketch It Pad. If you're not familiar with Sketch It Pad, it's got little rubber knobs on it. It's perfect for a number two pencil to stand up and make straight lines. It really draws a nice, clean diagram, nice sketch. Also, I use it for all my scope notes. So I have my wife to print usually four or five blank pages. Because it usually takes, I want one if I need one for the crawl space, I need one for a basement. Uh, I want to have an extra. Include all windows and doors in your sketches, exterior and interior. Now, you don't have to measure the size of them because we can put them into parameters and, and make them three by five or whatever, whatever they're set at. But it's required because they're going to deduct for drywall and sheathing, siding, any other things that we may have for window and door openings. I personally like to start the back left room. Some people like to start the kitchen. You guys know how to sketch. I'm not going to get into that, but whatever it is, I will tell you to do it the same every time. I make darn certain I like to have my, my scope notes and my photos definitely have to be in the same order. That way, when you're labeling your photos, if you get a house that got flooded eight feet deep and they've got the drywall out of it and you're moving from room to room, you're going to get lost in what room you're in. Now what I do, even if it's a four foot flood cut, when I change rooms, I stand in the hallway and take a picture of the next room through a door opening. That way I let my wife know that I'm changing rooms. Otherwise, if you just walk in and start taking corner to corner, they all start looking the same after a while. When I take photos, obviously I just stand in one corner, take, take a photo and just work my way around. They want long-term photos. Get four in each room, take a picture of the floor. I go take the first room, I go take a picture of the baseboard. I take a picture of the door. I take a picture of the window trim. I walk over and get at an angle and take a picture of the drywall. Does that sound stupid? I'll tell you why. Did a claim in New Orleans and I got it kicked back. Kenny, I can't tell from your photos that there's texture on that wall. I had it on my note on my notes, eggshell finish. Claims examiner kicked it back because she could not see from my photo that there was texture on the wall. She had a little talking, got a talking to from her supervisor. That's the last time I got that. So now I don't argue with them. I just Go and take a photo of it. Slick finish or whatever, I just take the photo of it. Paint the picture. I mentioned earlier, if it's got carpeting, I'll usually pull it back. I'll take a picture of the carpeting, pull it back, take a picture of the pad. Or if the carpet's been removed, I'll take a picture of the tack strip to show that there was carpeting in there. Uh, I go to a closet. If it got, if it got the drywall flooded, and we're gonna replace the wall, the drywall. I go into the first closet and I kick me a hole in that exterior wall with my heel. Why? 
Because I had a claim kicked out one time. Kenny, you didn't take a photo of exterior insulation. Can you verify that there's exterior insulation in this? I said, it's in Minnesota. What do you think? So now I learned from the lesson. I kick, I kick a hole. I take a picture of the insulation. I pull the insulation out and then I take a picture of the exterior sheathing. Why? Because they will allow us to replace some exterior sheathing now and some they won't. So I have to verify what type of sheathing it is. If it's Celotex, blackboard, if it's a gypsum board that's water resistant, if it's OSB, they will let us replace it. If it's plywood, they will not. They said it will dry out. A lot of dollars. And if it's got brick on it, we have to replace it from the inside. And that is cha-ching right there. Three dollars and sixty-five cents a square foot, or something. Or something. It's thirteen or fifteen dollars a square foot. It's it's a, it's it, it's money. Dang. Now, if it's got if it's got vinyl siding on it, you remove the vinyl siding and you replace the sheathing. If it's got wood siding on it, you replace the wood siding. You replace the sheathing. You replace the wood siding, and then you paint it. So the little things like that can add up a lot of dollars difference in the claim and a lot of adjusters will not do that. I take a picture of the receptacles with a tape on it to show whether or not they need replaced or whether they just need reset. If they're just replacing the drywall and it didn't get the receptacles, it still adds up six, seven, four or five receptacles plus, plus the switches because when you you gotta take the switches out because if you replace a four foot of drywall, you're gonna have float marks in it. And it's gonna get in the switch. So that I take a picture of the height of the switch to prove that the float marks are gonna get out. Why? Because I've had that kicked back before my claims of that. But the little detail things like that make a difference. And when you get a contractor coming and looking at the estimate that you have written, he's gonna sit there and he's gonna look at it and he's gonna go, wow. This guy's pretty thorough. Or he's gonna say, this guy left half everything off. Is it gonna make you look good or look bad? It's not gonna mean, somebody's gonna see your estimate. So, be thorough. I take a picture of, go ahead. Does the water have to reach the outlet in order to replace the outlets or get wicking? <sighs> You know, I, I if it gets to the bottom of the box or close to the bottom of the box, I'm going to replace it. Uh, sometimes my tape don't hit the floor. But if it's 14 inches up, then you have water to six inches. No, no, it's got to be close. I mean, it's got to be real close. I mean, because they can sit and look at your photos and have a pretty good idea how that, how that. But if it gets up to the bottom of the box. I may even pop a cover. Uh, but if I replace the receptacle, we always replace it with water. The room with water. Yeah. So it turns into what, 60 some dollars or? Yeah, it's 110. So it's, it's, yeah. So a even though. Dollar difference. Yeah. But uh, it has to get, it needs to be. It needs to get in the box. If it's that close, I kind of do the same thing that I might do on air conditioner, have an electrician look at it. One thing I did put on here was breaker boxes. Same with breaker boxes. I go into a room with a breaker box. I take a photo of the breaker box with the tape on it. It makes sure certain, I don't care if it's two foot water line, it's 50 inches to the box. I take a photo of it and say, no damage. If the water's up to it, I should take a picture of it, which a lot of them were last year. I take a picture of the breaker box, then I turn around and take a picture of the main to show if it's 100 amp or 200 amp. I actually take a picture of the breaker itself. Paint the picture. Your photos is your best friend. Windows. We had a lot of windows. We had a lot of them in Houston that got water on the windows. Now, if it's in a single pane aluminum glass, aluminum window, you're gonna clean it. 
because it, one, it was one brackish water. If it's brackish, we replace it. But fresh flood water, we're going to replace it. If it is a vinyl window, first thing I walk up to it, see how many reflections I got. That's how you tell the thermal paint. There'll be two reflections off the liner. It's thermal paint. Then I start looking for water or moisture between the glass. If there's water or moisture between the glass on any of the windows that I find, I'm gonna take a photo of it and I'm gonna replace all the windows. Um, same with patio door. Now, if they're wood windows and they get wet, replace, no question. If they're vinyl clad over wood, Anderson's or Pella's, I'm gonna replace. If they're Anderson or Pella windows, I'm gonna take a picture of the window and I'm gonna take a picture of that Anderson tag. Let them know they're high quality. Now you think a guy that's running in there and doing 10 a day is gonna stop and take the time to do that? No. As I mentioned earlier, I did a claim that I stayed underwater for a long period of time and had mold hanging on the roof, on ceilings. Take photos. You'll go into some houses. Believe it or not, if a house is underwater for three or four days in some of these southern areas, the ceiling fans all will be just drooping. If it is, take a photo of it. Because we can get that covered if it's caused by flood. If they could not get in to mitigate, mitigate the loss and get it cleaned up and dried out, if they were, if they were, it was not accessible, anything that damaged that it's caused, because of that, the flood will cover it. If they do it just because they decide to go on vacation and deal with it later and lock it up, they will not deal with it. When I write the scope notes to the room, I always start from the floor up. If it's, you know, subfloor, baseboard, drywall, and I use a lot of abbreviations. And uh, the only one that I haven't had difficult with, that I had difficult work with was EBBH, Electric Baseboard E. <laughs> they didn't, I, you didn't get that one. Bathrooms, do the same thing as you do, basically I started in a bedroom, except take a picture of the vanity, measure the vanity, do not guess. What type of top is on it? If it's a vanity, it's going to be replaced. We got water on it. However, if it's got a imitation marble top, the top will slap off, go right back on the new one. We will remove and reinstall that top as the level of faucets. We will not replace it. If it's got an older Famica top on it, it might have been built in place back in the days when they put the plywood on it, and built it, and routed it off. That cannot be saved. Take photo of it. Same with shower or tub. If you have a tub, I kick it. See if it's steel or cast iron. Tub surround. You ain't never gonna save a tub surround. We always get we get to replace those. Doors, electric uh, glass doors. Most of the time we, some of the times we can replace those, but most of the time we re reinstall. If they water got on them, got up on them, we'll replace them. But otherwise, we'll remove and reinstall. Faucets are remove and reinstall unless the water got over the top of them, in particular if it's brackish water. They're really picky on some things like that. Your PAs and stuff will try to replace supply lines, shutoffs, freshwater flood. They will not allow us to do that. We have to reuse them. Brackish water, we can replace them. Commodes, I love this one. First thing the Surf Pro will do is come in and get every commode and throw it out in the yard and break it. You know, they will clean up. They make us clean them up. They will not let us replace that commode, but they will let us put a new seat on it. <laughs> I'm getting into some things that you're going to get into in, some, um, in training but I wanted to touch on some of these, these items. Kitchens. Base cabinets replaced. 
upper cabinets are not replaced unless they're wet. As FEMA so eloquently said in one of the meetings, we don't care if they match. If it's a tall cabinet, they will not make you cut it in half, they'll let you replace it. So if it's a pantry or a tall cabinet. Countertops. Oh, have we had fun with countertops the last few years. If it's a marine, if if it's a low water flood, water did not get on the countertops, and it's a Formica countertop, it's a preformed roll top countertop that just screwed on from the bottom. They'll make us reinstall, remove, reinstall. If it's built in place, replace. If it's ceramic tile, obviously that cannot be saved. Replace. If it is a granite, which we have a lot of these. If it's a granite top or quartz, but primarily granite, that's what we run into in Houston. Get a photo of it, measure the thickness of it. Tell the insured, when they take this top off, I want somebody standing here with a camera. And the minute that sucker snaps, I want a photo. If it breaks while they're taking it off, we will replace it. Otherwise, it has to be reinstalled. Unless they did let it do some, I didn't have, I'm, if water gets over it, they'll let you replace it. But we didn't have any of those in Houston, I don't think they got over the countertops. But we had a ton of them that broke. So a lot of times we'd have an estimate ready to write and I'd wait a week until I found out with the countertop. And after the countertop, I'd call them, what happened to your countertop? The breaker, did you get it off? Because I wanted to know because I didn't want to do a supplement. Appliances, as I mentioned earlier, we have to have a photo of every appliance. And as I mentioned, I take a photo of the refrigerator, the tag, open the door and get the serial number and model number. And that's where carrying a flashlight comes in handy because I have my camera on automatic. If you pull your flashlight out and shine it in there, it'll keep the flash from flashing and you can get a good photo. Otherwise it'll flash and you have to turn your flash off. Now, uh, that's always fun, particularly in Louisiana. Everybody's got 10 pounds of shrimp in their refrigerator and they ain't cleaned it out, trust me. But we have to get photos of anything that has a serial number on it. You want to get a photo of it. Anything over $300, if they got contents coverage, you want to get a photo of it. Washer and dryer, same thing. Washer, name tag, serial number. But that's why I had Aaron doing all this while I was meeting with the people so he could get all, have all this worked out. And that helped us get done. We were doing uh, six a day. So we were doing uh, 15 hour and a half per claim is what we was using there. Here's the appliance sheet. They also don't be in your packet. Ready to yes. If you replace the condenser outside on AC unit, you automatically replace the air handler and egg coil and all that inside. Very good question. The answer to that is no. Not unless it's directly damaged. Not unless it's damaged by flood. They don't care. The new AC regardless of the new AC units use the new use the new Freon. And it's not compatible with the A coils and the air handler. And they say we gotta put in a new air handler and A coils and new lines to make it. Now we might be able to get the new lines paid for. If we get it estimate written correctly, but they're not gonna pay for that air handler. They don't care. We have, we have a lot of those, a lot of those. Now new, and, and Sandy, they were still being able to get the old ones at that time. But since then, that is a, that is a, that is a, that is a big issue. How do they get away with that? Is there a specific term which in the policy? Policy won't pay to match. Pay, it's not a match policy and it only pays for direct contact, physical contact with the It doesn't license. pay for upgrades, codes, and yeah. specified exclusions. Yep. Yeah, it won't even pay for codes. What about bringing, bringing the homeowner back to the home the way it was pre existing? Oh, they don't care. They don't care about that. I don't know. Yeah. You gotta remember this. Is, Federal government. <laughs> <laughs> now, did I understand you say on your vinyl double pane windows, if you found one window that was clouded, you replaced them all downstairs? Is that what you did? I would. Okay. Once so I found one. photo was sufficient? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, one flood over sufficient. If you got water in, in one of them where it seals busted or if it's got a lot of moisture inside it. Same with the patio door. Uh, Depends really on window height. If one room has windows to the floor that were within the oh, yeah. water height. Oh yes. Then it goes there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you got windows like this, it's next to the floor and you got a two foot water line, but we're not going to replace the one in the kitchen or bathroom that's the four feet up. No. Because we don't care if they match. Tell them about the policy. You have to send out a, a denial letter for that. We don't. The insurance company. Somebody else. Well, in, our, right in, 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 our, in, in our closing narrative, we will put send a denial letter for. You make a recommendation. That's another thing that I'm glad you mentioned that. And one of the things I do mention to people, I try to, flood insurance adjuster has no authority. The only authority we have is make a recommendation. So unlike a claims adjuster for a direct rider, we're not creating a waiver of estoppel. And I try to tell them that, and I, and I tell them that. I tell them this way, I, it's my recommendation and I got just enough gray hair and just enough money they don't argue with me, hold on. Because when we don't try to force anything in, if I'm going to try to force something in, I want to get an expert to look at it and I want them to put on there that it's damaged by flood and I want something to cover my tail end. Yes. Apologize for the question. No, questions are good. Okay, so you, you mentioned that if there's a discrepancy on the loss notice, mm -hmm. like the mortgage company is incorrect. Right? Yes. Do they need to get that information, the correct information to you and you submit it? Yes. Or do they submit it directly? No, you got to submit it. quicker if the insured sends it to the adjuster first. And you include it in your documents. Yep. Yeah. It's quicker on the insured's behalf because it has to clear under bank before the carrier's going to make payment. If it goes through policy service, if the agent doesn't, it may get lost and get tied up. And so I want, I want, I want control of it, if possible. Just talking about coverages. Tell you how vague this policy is. All right, I'm pretty good at reading policies. Only the federal government could write this policy. In fact, FEMA has made 20 rulings the last 10 years on coverage definitions on what's covered and not covered. They went back and forth on some items two and three times in the nine years I've been working. And they always get, every year it's a no project on what they're gonna get on. It's like, it's, it's like, what are we gonna do this? But you have a bunch of government employees sitting around trying to figure out how to write an insurance policy. They didn't get an insurance policy. It's not an ISO policy. It's, it's not an ISO HO3 policy, something. Same with everything. This thing is, Poorly written as document as I've ever read in my life. <laughs> and that's why you gotta have somebody, you gotta have, a, as I used to call it, you gotta have the shell answer man that you can call and say, what in the world is this? How can we cover this and how can we cover it? And sometimes we'll take it, we'll, we'll go up the ladder until we get a yes or a no. And if we're not uncertain, we may send it in and Recommended for denial. Recommended for denial or carrier policy. I got it. Is there a situation where you get an expert that comes back out on the back end of it and they say, yeah, we know it was the flood, but the power was on and we had a power surge that actually damaged the inside. I ain't got nothing to do with the flood. All your homeowners. Even if it was created by the water? Doesn't matter. Wow. Consequential damage. Got it. They love that. But if it's damaged and it got wet, <laughs> we'll try to find a way to flood cause it. We don't have that that much because they do, you know, there's going to be power surges. Now we have had a lot of televisions. I have a television hanging on the wall and the cord's down low. And by golly, it'll blow the TV. And I usually tell them, you need, I need something from the appliance guy saying that this was caused by the flood because the TV itself wasn't damaged. So I, I want something to cover my tail end. Because remember, if we pay for something that we're not supposed to, we gotta pay it back. So they say. After I get done with my inspection, I always go back over everything with the insured real briefly. 
just to give him a brief idea, when we replace the subfloor, we're going to replace the baseboard, drywall four feet, paint the ceilings, replace the window trim, replace the insulation on the outside, the sheathing, all your doors and all your windows. That way he has a general idea. Well, this is what I'm going to include in my estimate. Recommend. And that way when they, when you leave, they have a pretty good idea what is going to be in their estimate. They know that they got to get their contents list done or it's going to delay them getting their building estimate. And they're usually stress level is a little bit lower and they feel like, hey, maybe I can come out of this thing okay. Any questions on the inspection? You want to ask, during your inspection, your consultation, proof of loss, do you ever take a copy of the proof of loss given to them? No. Ask them to complete it and sign it no. freely? No, because I, I'm not going to do the proof of loss until the estimate is completed and the Xactimate's going to print me that, going to fill it in for me, ready for their signatures. You want it to match your estimate? Absolutely. So, when you do the Xactimate estimate, it will complete. That's one of the flood forms that will complete automatically for you. So, one thing I have done and recommended is if you get that insured that refuses to sign your estimate. All right. Hand them an empty form, fill it out what you what the insured would say. What, what do you recommend that you get paid? If they put in numbers higher than yours, you can submit your paperwork, recommend a denial for the difference, and they can still continue the payment. Yep. Based on your recommendations. The proof of loss only states that you are verifying that you had a flood loss. A flood claim is never closed. So it doesn't mean that you can't come back and do a self -flood. It doesn't mean that they can't get a PA. It doesn't mean they're never closed. But that's why I was curious about what they could put any amount in there. Didn't oh yeah, we're going to deny it. If it didn't match my estimate, right. I'm going to recommend right. denying the insurance company going to send them a denial letter for their proof of loss. But since they have submitted proof of loss that they had a flood, then that allows the insurance company to go ahead and pay off my estimate and then let them appeal or go for the difference. Yes. Can you discuss life and county? Life county equality? <laughs> so basically, life kind of quality is just determined on the house. Uh, if it's a high grade home, high quality home, you'd want to document that it's a hard one. Uh, cabinets. Do you want to document the, the style of the cabinets? Are they butterfly? Are they hardwood? Are they particleboard? What's the, the grade? At that point, you can include the, the certain grade in your estimate based on your documentation. You need to verify it though. Particularly, we have adjusters, particularly these eight, these eight claim wonders that go around all day. They'll write an estimate and they'll put the absolute, the highest grade of everything that they can in it because they don't put a half the stuff in it thinking that I'm just going to send it up and see if it goes through. Well, you know, I'll give you an example. When I, when I started, they wanted things. When we did Simpson, they wanted it generic. They wanted baseboard. Okay. And in Sandy, they wanted baseboard. Interior doors. I mean, pre-hung doors, blah, 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 blah. They didn't want six panel fiberboard doors. They didn't want itemized, detailed, stain grade, paint grade, whatever. Maybe. Then, now they do. Now, if it's a if it's a six inch mahogany baseboard, you take a photo of it and you put down six inch mahogany baseboard, stain grade. So you try to match it up and you get it as detailed as you possibly can. That's one major difference between writing estimates today and and then four or five, four or five years ago. Cuts down on supplements. Yep. I hate supplements. I don't care. Anything? Uh, any other questions? Let's take about 10 minutes and then we're gonna finish. <laughs>